But for tonight's program, we are going to talk about one of Chicago's favorite writers, Nelson Algren. Um, our special guest tonight is Colin Asher. I uh, began writing in 2007 after amassing a biography worthy of an Algren lover. He worked as a truck driver, a bike messenger. Oh, I did that too. A warehouse assistant, dropped out of high school, moved to California. I didn't do that. Um, from Brooklyn, and he found in Nelson Algren the stories of single working mothers, fearless children, waitresses, welfare cases, petty criminals, and dropouts with outsized dreams, characters through whose lives he could see his own. Colin's work has been published in The Believer, the Los Angeles Review of Books, the Boston Globe, and the San Francisco Chronicle, as well as literary journals such as Frequency, Swink, and Satellite, and others. Never a Lovely So Real has been called vigorous, poetic, devotional, beautifully written, and worthy, and a worthy tribute to one of America's best and best loved writers. So please help me and welcome Colin. Thank you. Well, that was lovely. Whoever that person is you introduced sounds very impressive. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming out. It's always lovely to be in Chicago. I get a good crowd here in New York. About 10 people know who Nelson Auburn is, and that's how many show up. Oh, sorry. Better? Yes? All right. Uh, but yes, in the Chicago area, always a good crowd. I was at the Nelson Auburn Museum in April uh, to a packed house, which was lovely and encouraging. Uh, in any case, uh, this is the book. Um, it's a biography of Nelson Algren. I feel I probably don't need to introduce him much, but maybe a little. Um, born in 1909, died in 1981, won the first National Book Award. Of course, long identified with Chicago, and most notably for his masterpiece, The Man with the Golden Arm. Um, I assume most people here know that, though. Uh, one of the things that interested me most about Algren, <clears throat> uh, besides his characters, and uh, as the introduction mentioned, the fact that I could sort of identify with him, uh, was the way he thought about writing. And Algren is a person who thought a lot about the purpose of writing and its social function. That really drew me to his work. And tonight, uh, I'll be making some remarks and then reading from two different sections of the book, both focused on that, where he's struggling not just with how to write and how to get published and how to forge a career, but more importantly, with why he should be writing what the function of literature should be. Uh, and as I hope to explain tonight, those ideas change over time. Um, he came of age during the Great Depression, um, which forever shaped his ideas about America and about the meritocracy and, and infused his work with <clears throat> a sense of social justice right from the beginning. Um, I'm going to sort of start there. Like I said, I'll make some remarks, and then I'll read from two different sections of the book, and then there should be time at the end for questions. So, uh, Nelson Algren graduated from college in the spring of 1931 with the intention of becoming a journalist. He was full of confidence and his hopes were high. Just before his classes ended, he received a press credential from the Illinois Press Association. It was a little card bearing his name and listing his skills, and he invested it with great significance. It meant, he said later, that I could be whatever I wanted to be. Algren was well qualified for his chosen profession, but unfortunately that year, like many in American history, ambition, talent, and qualification were not enough. The year of Algren's graduation was also the bleakest of the Great Depression, and when he returned home to Chicago and moved back into his parents' house, he discovered there was no work to be found in journalism or in any other profession. Unemployment was near 25% that year. Hundreds of people slept in the parks every night, and the Communist Party marched through the streets, on average, more than once every day. Algren spent months looking for work in Chicago with no luck and then decided to look more broadly and left the city alone to continue his search. He expected his travels to be brief and to find employment that would allow him to settle down and begin a career, but here again he was disappointed. He traveled north first, got stranded in Minneapolis with no money and had to ask his eldest sister for a loan so he could make his way home. Then he traveled south and east, through southern Illinois and Kentucky and then farther. He moved by hopping freight trains, hitching rides, or walking, and as his search dragged on, he lost faith in both his ability to earn a living and the basic tenets of the American political and economic system. Algren's vagabondage lasted more than a year, during which time he was jailed more than once for vagrancy and traveled more than 3,000 miles. He found himself in Chicago again at the end of that year, back where he'd begun, but a very different man. Remembering that period later, Algren claimed that his experiences on the road permanently changed the way he saw the world. Everything I'd been told was wrong, he said. I'd been assured that it was a strive and succeed world, 
But this was not what America was. America was not socialized, and I resented very <clears throat> deeply that I'd been lied to. It was in that context, in early 1933, that Algren decided to become a creative writer instead of a journalist. He felt there was nothing else he could do, that he had exhausted every possibility for traditional success, and that it was his obligation to tell the world what he had learned on the road. <clears throat> and he felt, too, that America had exhausted its potential and needed to change if it were going to survive. These two ideas twined in Algren's mind so that, from the very beginning of his career, he was as concerned with how to write and publish as he was with the purpose of his work, its social function. He continued to dwell on those subjects for the entirety of his career, periodically updating his ideas to reflect his progress as a writer in the changing political times. At first, Algren intended his writing to be a tool of the revolution. Not long after he began writing, he became involved with the Communist Party and the proletarian literature movement. Within a year of returning to Chicago, he began calling himself a revolutionary artist. Speaking about <clears throat> that time later, he said, I believed the world was changing, and I wanted to help change it. During that period, and in that mood, Algren wrote a handful of stories, as well as his first novel, Somebody in Boots, an angry book, infused with overt social critique and laced with revolutionary rhetoric. The book was deeply felt and brutally honest, but it was a commercial failure, a fact that sent Algren into a depressive fugue that dragged on for months. <clears throat> During that time, he began a relationship with a woman named Amanda, drifted away from the political circles he'd been traveling in, and found work. First, for months, he and Amanda focused solely on feeding themselves and maintaining a household. By early 1936, Algren felt stable enough to emerge from his seclusion and reconnect with the worlds of literature and politics. But when he did, he found that both had changed in his absence, and he had to reorient himself and his art and rethink the purpose of his work. Uh, so as I say, that brings us up to 1936, and I'll pick up there from the book. <clears throat> Nelson spent his days loading trucks in early 1936, and his afternoons wandering the city in search of people he could interview or eavesdrop on. He went home after dark and tried to write while Amanda read. Sometimes he perused the daily papers, looking for material he could use in his stories, but he was often disappointed because most of the news that spring and summer was news of war. Left-wing political parties took power in Spain in March, and 150,000 of their supporters stormed Madrid, waving red flags in celebration. Hitler sent troops into the Rhineland in violation of a peace treaty, and Italy tried to snatch Ethiopia from the Emperor Haile Selassie. When the League of Nations called for peace, Prime Minister Benito Mussolini responded coolly. Equality between Italy and Ethiopia, he said, does not exist in the Italian lexicon. The Italian army crushed Selassie's at Mechu before the end of the month, and then followed the battle's survivors to Lake Ashang and gassed them. The German government announced that every German child was required to enroll in Nazi youth organizations in April, and the following month, Emilio Mola began laying the groundwork for a fascist coup in Spain. In June, on German Day, 50,000 people gathered in Soldier Field in Chicago to watch children march behind swastika flags while giving stiff-armed Nazi salutes, and Spain was cleaved by civil war in July. Nelson retreated from the world when he met Amanda, and he'd been living a quiet life since. But he reforged his ties to the Communist Party when, the wars, began breaking, when wars began breaking out. He marched in protest when Italy invaded Ethiopia, and again when the Spanish Civil War began. Then he and Richard Wright founded the Chicago chapter of the League of American Writers and used it to raise money for the fighters opposing the fascist coup. When Nelson returned to the political fold, he discovered <clears throat> again that the landscape had shifted since he was last involved. Energy that had once gone into reversing evictions and marching to demand full employment was being directed instead towards Spain and toward challenging fascists in America. The Communist Party was forging alliances with liberals and progressives, and proletarian literature was an afterthought. Leaflets and pamphlets hold the power to strike a blow, hammer against the minds of the workers, Nelson's friend Jack Conroy proclaimed in 1935. It was a powerful idea, but its shelf life was short. One year later, it felt hopelessly naive. Words could not save Madrid or keep Hitler from marching on Stalingrad, so the proletarian writers' movement lost momentum and coasted back toward the margins of the literary world. The last change was the most significant for Nelson. It liberated him. 
He had published in proletarian journals and benefited from his connection to the John Reed Club, but his work never fit the genre. He wrote about the poor, not the working class, and his accommodations to the form were clumsy and insincere. Two sections of Somebody in Boots, his first novel, are introduced by quotations from the Communist Manifesto, and in one of his early short stories, a character sings, Rise up, workers, farmers, to battle. Those feints embarrassed him later, and when the party lost interest in literature, he accepted their disregard as a gift. From that point forward, he was a communist at protests and political meetings, but he wrote on his own terms. When Nelson wasn't working, organizing, or marching that spring, he was reading. His taste was omnivorous. He read and reread Dostoevsky, Alexander Kuprin, and Stephen Crane, and discovered new levels of meaning each time. He admired the way Dostoevsky claimed all of St. Petersburg as his subject and was in awe of Kuprin's dedication to accuracy. Kuprin's most controversial novel was a detailed account of life inside a Russian brothel entitled Yama. The research took years, and Kuprin conducted it by living among the women he wrote about. Stephen Crane's novella, Maggie, A Girl of the Streets, also became a touchstone for Nelson. It's a brutal thing, as unsparing in its depiction of poverty as somebody in boots, but free of rhetoric. Crane paid to print the book himself because no publisher would touch the material, and Nelson admired him for that. Nelson also read through the works of the generation of Chicago writers who preceded him and drank in their mash of naturalistic observation and lyricism. Theodore Dreiser achieved something lasting with Sister Carrie because he was brave enough to write <clears throat> without fear of public censor, Nelson thought. Carl Sandburg's poetry entranced him. It was so beautiful it could reverse the natural order of things. Stormy, husky, brawling. City of the big shoulders, Sandberg wrote, leave laughing even as an ignorant fighter laughs who has never lost a battle. And afterward, Chicago raced to become the place he described. Life is in ourselves and not in the external. To be a human being among human beings and remain one forever, no matter what misfortunes befall, not to become depressed and not to falter. This is what life is. Herein lies its task, Dostoevsky wrote. Crane said, environment is a tremendous thing in the world and frequently shapes lives. The chasm between those positions echoes the conflict first wrestled with in college. Stoicism and personal responsibility to the right. The constraints of society to the left. Kupin wrote to persuade. He hoped Yama would hasten the abolition of prostitution, a trade he described as a worse evil than war or famine. Sandberg made no grand pronouncements. Nelson decided the single thread connecting his literary hero's work was perspective. Each had discovered the truth about their society among the born to be doomed. That insight raised novel questions for Nelson, and he answered them in time, using a vernacular of his own construction. Good writing comes from the gut, he began saying, and the greatest literary works open a wedge for the inarticulate of the world. How to write, Nelson began to think, is a less meaningful question than why. Literature must challenge authority and defy demagoguery, he decided. It is born in fidelity to the truth and crumbles into incoherence in its absence. The writer's job, he wrote, is to put down the world of reality by working without haste as the story grows within, regardless of all social and moral ideas, regardless of whom your report may please or offend, regardless of whether the critics stand up and cheer for a month or take hammer and tongs after you or simply ignore you, regardless of all forms, of all institutions, of all set ways of conduct and thought, regardless, chiefly, of what the writer himself prefers to believe, know, think, or feel. The emphasis of Nelson's work changed again that year. His first publications are largely autobiographical. So Help Me, his first short story, <coughs> is the story of the Luthers. Boots is, loosely, the chronicle of his vagabondage, imprisonment, and politicization. But in 1936, Nelson began following Cooper's lead by immersing himself in unfamiliar parts of the city. I was just going around Chicago, he said later, watching, listening, recording. Property owners demolished buildings by the hundreds to avoid being, paying taxes that year, and scab-kneed children played in debris-strewn lots. Squatters occupied condemned buildings along South State Street, and families slept in parks. The Illinois Workers' Alliance marched on City Hall to demand jobs. A union leader was shotgunned in the street. Three women were beaten to death with hammers in their hotel rooms. A man walked into Humboldt Park, shot himself in the head, and had his pocket picked before his body cooled. And Nelson tried to absorb it all. I went to a walkathon, one of these three-day, I mean, everlasting dance marathons. I spent a couple days there, he said. 
and started a whole series of stories about the cheap hotels in South State Street. He visited brothels and flop houses, walked through the parks, listened to barkers calling outside dime burlesques, and by summer he had formed the genesis of the idea that eventually defined his career. He was going to write a series of books that would provide an accurate description of the city. The first would be set in Chicago's near northwest side, close to the neighborhood where Amanda was raised. Three more would follow. He described his plan in a fellowship application a few years later. This project would attempt to relate the economy of a representative cultural pocket to incidents of delinquency therein. As I said, a fellowship application, not his best work. It would attempt presentation of economic and political factors making toward juvenile criminality among 300,000 Poles inhabiting a clearly defined geographic area. Its presentation would be through the methods of naturalism, and its scope confined to a fictionalized portrayal of some 45 case histories. Volume 2 will deal with the Italian areas, centering around Halstead and Taylor. <clears throat> volume 3 with the Negro Belt between 47th and 35th Streets, and the final volume with the Mexican section of East Chicago and Gary. <clears throat> Uh, I'll break from the book there and say that the first book in that series, he did finish writing. It's called Never Come Morning. It came out in 1942. It's his first great novel. Um, it took him about six years to write. Uh, and just after it was finished, um, he was drafted into the Army. So he enters the Army in 1943, um, spends about a year stateside, and then ends up in Europe. Had a very difficult time in the Army. It took him a long time to get overseas. He requested placement numerous times and was turned down uh, for somewhat nebulous reasons, most likely because the army knew that he had been a member of the Communist Party. Uh, and that was distressing to him. When he did get to Europe, he uh, wanted very much to see the front lines. He referred to it as the big stuff of his generation and, and never did manage to, really. He got close to, close to gunfire about one, about one time, I think. And when hostilities end, he's sort of stranded in France. Um, the army has nothing for him to do, uh, but they also can't get him home because there's a rush to get home. Uh, I'm going to pick up there. Uh, the section, I'm uh, jumping from about 1936 to 1945. Uh, we'll pick up late in 45. He's in Marseille, uh, living on a muddy hillside. And thinking about what he wants to do when he gets home what he wants his work to be about, what purpose it's going to serve. He's done with politics in a formal way at this point. He's done with the Communist Party. He broke with them years earlier. So he has to figure out how to reorient himself again. Uh, so like I said, we'll pick up the end of 1945. <clears throat> Maasai was a ruin when Nelson arrived. The Germans had occupied the city for nearly two years, and they had been brutal stewards. In the old port district, walls jutted from piles of rubble like tombstones set at the heads of burial mounds, and cobblestones that had been ripped from the streets had collected into huge piles. Dozens of boats rested on their keels in the shallow water of the port, where the Germans sank them in a vain, in a vain attempt to hold off the Allies, and the walls of the cathedral overlooking the city, Notre Dame de la Garde, were pocked with bullet holes. The muddy hillside beneath the church had become a campground for GIs after the fighting ceased, and when Nelson reached Marseille, he joined them. His superiors ordered him to stay there until they could get him back to Chicago, but they couldn't say when that would happen or how. I just had a cot in my belongings, Nelson said later, and in the morning the sergeant would come and tell me what outfit I belonged to. He'd say, now you're tank corps. The next day he'd say, now you're field artillery. They tried everything to get us on that boat. The town was full, full of guys with arms, Nelson said. There were British troops, Americans, Canadians, and Senegalese, and because there were few military police to keep them in check, the black market thrived. Brothels operated 24 hours a day, poker games went all night, and soldiers were able to trade American cigarettes or oranges for sex or wine. The city was a wild and free place, and Nelson loved it. Every morning I crept out of my little shelter half, jumped on a truck without a pass, and spent the whole day living off the black market, he explained. I was responsible to nobody or anything. Nelson lived that way for three months, and later, when he thought back on the weeks he spent trading Eisenhower coats <clears throat> for Chianti and studying the wrecked ships rocking in the port, he recognized them as the most isolated but least despairing of his life. I was the anonymous man, he said. I was finally myself. When I crept back into my camp each night with nothing to show for the long day's toil but half a bottle of cheap red wine, that, for me, was the happy time. But eventually, Nelson began to long for home. It seemed like it was time, he said. 
I'd been drifting for years, first riding the rails and then jumping around, and after that, jumping around with the army from place to place. I was ready, he said, to stop moving and do one thing the rest of my life and live in one place and write and simply not be preoccupied either with politics or with anything that wasn't pertinent to myself. The army delivered Nelson to Camp Grant in Illinois on a gloomy Tuesday in November and moved him into a wooden barracks building. It was just above freezing and snow was falling lightly. The base was just a couple hundred wooden buildings set on a barren plain north and west of Chicago and for four days Nelson did nothing but mark time, something he'd grown accustomed to in the service. Then, on his fifth day back in Illinois, he reported to the base's separation center and accepted $160.60 in an honorable discharge form that said, Private Nelson Algren spent two years, four months, and 17 days in the Army. He earned two overseas service bars, an American campaign medal, a European-African Middle Eastern theater ribbon, and one bronze battle star, and a good conduct medal. He was a literary writer when he entered the service and a litter bearer when he left. When Nelson reached Chicago later that day, he went looking for a flower shop, and when he found one, he bought his mother a dozen roses. Then he located a payphone and dialed Ravenswood 2405. He let it ring for a while, but Goldie didn't answer. Nelson wanted to hear a friendly voice, but there weren't many people left in Chicago for him to call. Amanda was living in California, and most of his friends were gone. Some had chased opportunity east toward the publishing industry while he was away. Others had drifted west toward Hollywood. Some died in the war, and a few let their radical pretensions die, bought tiny homes in Gary, Indiana, and spent their time trying to earn enough money to make up for the years they dedicated to the revolution. Nelson tried a few more numbers, but they all rang in vain, so he searched the directory until he found a listing for Margaret Butler, Dorothy Farrell's widowed mother. He dialed, and Dorothy's voice came through the line. She and Nelson hadn't seen each other in years, not since 1939, possibly. But, he was happy, but she was happy he called. Come over, she said. Nelson found Dorothy's building on a maple lined street near the University of Chicago, and when he rang her bell, she invited him inside and told him to make himself at home. Her sister, Virginia, was visiting as well, and the family apartment was large and comfortable. There was food and liquor on hand, and Nelson spent the day talking about the war, catching up on events in Chicago and cracking jokes. He was one of the wittiest men I've ever known, Dorothy said. Dorothy and Virginia asked Nelson to stay for dinner, and he accepted. He finally reached Goldie after he finished eating, said his goodbyes, and prepared to leave. Do you want to take these flowers to your mother, Dorothy asked. No, the flowers are for you, Nelson lied. Then he made his way to the single basement room at 2717 Lawrence Avenue, where Goldie was living, greeted her, and settled in among the debris of their family's past. A framed newspaper dating back to the Civil War. A cuckoo clock cotton doilies hanging from a hook on the wall, and all the dishes he'd once, that had once filled the cupboards in their house on North Troy Street. Spontaneous celebrations erupted all over Chicago when the Japanese Empire surrendered to the Allies in August of 1945. Two elderly women began marching through the streets, banging drums, and thousands of people fell in line behind them. Six young girls dressed as drum majorettes led a separate march through downtown, and a soldier standing on a rooftop at the corner of State and Randolph waved an American flag in each hand while crowds passed below them. Bonfires appeared at intersections, and a motorman drove an L train around the loop, blowing his whistle the entire way. Wild abandoned ruled for a night, but days of somber reflection followed. This is a day in which we should all express our eternal debt to those who laid down their lives or suffered wounds or torture that we might continue to be free, an Illinois senator said. VJ Day means more than the end of hostilities, the governor proclaimed. It means we're about to embark on a new era of peace and restoration. Sears Roebuck ran an advertisement claiming that hope, thought, understanding, and love would safeguard America's future and Scores of people attended group prayers to reflect on the war and ask searching questions about the future of humankind. It was an idealistic and heartening moment, but it passed quickly. Over the next few months, survival was reframed as victory, and the reflective tone that defined the first days after the war was replaced with triumphalism and paranoia. The Tribune published a picture of blanket-draped corpses above a caption that read, German military detainees await hospitalization after mass suicide attempt, and its headlines became boastful. Nazi general dies before U.S. firing squad, they crowed. Jap prince to face trial, and, ominously, red meddling in U.S. affairs under scrutiny. 
love and understanding seemed like quaint ideas by the time Nelson reached Chicago because by then mass consumption and status seeking had supplanted them as guiding principles. This piece on Earth Christmas, give him the diamond ring he wants so much, advertisements counseled, and get your post-war kitchen now. Plots of land on the outskirts of town were for sale, and so were prefabricated houses and strobosonic radios and phonographs. The Fidelity Loan Bank on Clark Street was selling the pawn jewelry it had bought during the war at liquidation prices. The spoils of war <clears throat> were as available to Nelson as to any other veteran with an honorable discharge, but he did not indulge. That winter he bought a radio and a second-hand bicycle, but no diamonds, suits, or cars. He could have used his GI benefits to purchase a home <clears throat> excuse me, on the edge of the city with no money down, but instead he returned to his old neighborhood and looked for an apartment where he could work without distraction. In January, he found a cold water flat that suited him on the second floor of 1523 West Wabansia Avenue. Trash cans piled with refuse lined the sidewalk out front and stray newspaper pages gathered in the gutters. There was no refrigerator. Heat was provided by an oil stove and the shower was down the hall, but the rent was only $10 a month and the bedroom was large enough to double as an office. There were large windows in each room and when he gazed through them he saw a street light, a peach tree growing through the sidewalk, a saloon called the Lucky Star that displayed a neon Schlitz sign in its window, and a yeast factory. Nelson moved into the apartment when it became available. Then he began to reacquaint himself with the city. He watched the bar's windows and the strangers passing them on the sidewalk. He could see well enough through the glass bricks set in the bar's front walls to know when people were playing cards inside, and sometimes he joined them. He visited the YMCA to exercise and shower every day, dropped by his old haunts in the Triangle, and began attending police lineups again so he could transcribe the chief detective's interrogations. You're a jack roller, he wrote. No, I'm Mexican. Haven't worked the past year. Just got out of the Bridewell Wednesday. People were talking about recovery that winter. They said Chicago was destined to play a prominent role in the American century, but the city didn't feel much change to Nelson. The L still wobbled on uneven rails and sent sparks into the night. There was a housing shortage, and people were having a hard time finding jobs. Massive labor strikes were making headlines, and poverty remained endemic. The city's newest black residents were crowding into tenements on the south side because redlining and housing covenants prevented them from moving to more affluent neighborhoods. And the suburban migration that mortgage brokers referred to as the American dream was Nelson knew, nothing more than white flight. The only change Nelson could discern was the story Chicago had begun telling about itself. The city was defined by its industry when he was a child. It transformed into a gangster's town later and then a battlefield for the class war. Now it was trying to remake itself as the backdrop to a domestic drama, featuring men wearing gray flannel suits and chaste women in neatly pressed house dresses. They took their social cues from look, leader, pageant, and bazaar, and they believed that virtue and consumption were synonymous. There were Fords in their garages, and the Family Circle magazine on their coffee tables. That image seemed dangerously dishonest to Nelson, and the emphasis of his work shifted in response to it. He had been planning to write a series of novels set in, the neighborhoods set in neighborhoods defined by their dominant ethnic group, but after he returned home from the war, he began thinking in grander terms. Chicago, he realized, was a perfect synecdoche for the country, a place so in love with the idea of its virtue that it was willing to disavow, in the name of the common good, anyone who failed to meet its narrow and exacting standards. It had great symbolic value for that reason and Nelson decided that using his work to undermine that image would be more impactful than continuing to develop the naturalistic novels he outlined years earlier. This project defined the next decade of Nelson's career. He used his fictional writing to create a counter-narrative by humanizing the people who had failed before the radio commercials and fallen short of the standards of every self-respecting magazine, and he addressed the country's shortcomings directly in his non-fiction writing. Despite what you've been told, he wrote, Millions of Americans still live out their hand-to-mouth hours without friendship or love. They belong to no particular street and no particular city. They pass from furnished room to furnished room and belong not even to their own time, not even to themselves. Every day is D-Day under the L, he proclaimed. And the lucky few who manage to climb the social ladder derive little satisfaction from their reward. 
Never has any people possessed such a, such a superfluity of physical luxuries, companioned by such a dearth of emotional necessities, he wrote. In no other country is such great wealth acquired so purposefully, put to such small purpose. Never has any people driven itself so resolutely toward such diverse goals to derive so little satisfaction from attainment of any. That's it. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, right where I stopped. Uh, after that, he writes his first collection of short stories, which is called The Neon Wilderness, uh, his second great book, and then immediately after that, um, finishes The Man with the Golden Arm, uh, sort of motivated by the ideas that I was discussing there at the end. Instead of just a naturalistic study of a group of people living in a neighborhood, he decided to <clears throat> sort of find greater themes that he saw resonating throughout America within the neighborhood that he already had been writing about when he wrote Never Come Morning. Well, he, uh, he says directly in a letter to somebody during that period of time that I, could, I can go to Washington and perjure myself by saying I was not. So, yes. Um, yes, I believe he was. Uh, there is also a letter that exists uh, written in 1937 where he says, as a member of the party in good standing. Uh, um, quite a lot. So the FBI first started investigating him in 1940 and continued for about a quarter century. Um, Hoover twice... Uh, if I remember correctly, the first time that the F FBI agents were directed to investigate him was at Hoover's command. They sort of lost interest in him for a while, and then in the 50s, after their investigation had gone dormant, Hoover intervened again to say, reopen his file and look into him again. Um, uh, the FBI file is 886 pages long, so there's quite a bit in it, um, uh, including, importantly for me, uh, they were great reporters. There's lots of accounts of where he was and who he was involved with and what he was saying at various meetings. Um, even nice little tidbits like, you know, the names of his neighbors when he was living on, um, I think when he was living on West Evergreen, the FBI agents found out the name, who his neighbors were and, and discovered that they were loyal to him, so they shouldn't approach them. Um, but who, like I said, Hoover did twice in intercede. In uh, so two stories there, yes. Um, so maybe a little background uh, for everybody else. But um, Nelson had a friend named Dave Peltz who lived in Miller Beach in Gary, Indiana. And um, as I learned from you, um, the Gary police would spy on Peltz and write down the license plate numbers of people coming and going from his house because he was known to associate with Algren. And there are mentions in the file of the FBI being in touch with the Gary police and of agents being outside Algren's house and writing down license plate numbers as well. And, and the other story here is a, a famous poker story that um, uh, Nelson and Dave Peltz and a number of other people used to run a poker game in the early 60s after Nelson had returned to Chicago from Gary. And at one point, he and Peltz, who was still living in Miller Beach at the time, get into a conflict with the people they were gambling with. Nelson's convinced these people are cheating. Uh, and tell, tells Peltz to cancel his check, which results in two guys throwing a brick through Dave Peltz's window. Uh, he didn't go to the cops because he knew these guys, um, and he resolved it with them personally. And the good, the best part, to my mind, of this story is that Peltz was also friends with Saul Bellow, and Peltz told Bellow the whole story, and Bellow then put the whole story into a novel, <laughs> which uh, Peltz did not appreciate. Um, I forget, there are two Bellow biographies. I forget which one it is. One of them has some good um, snippets of correspondence between Peltz and Bellow, where Peltz says, you're a thief, basically. This is my, this is my life. You're talking about Peltz? I mean, by, by that time, Peltz wasn't politically active, but he had been in, in the 30s. And I think probably if the police were interested in him, it was just his associations. He was friends with Studs, too, and Studs, Studs Turkle was uh, also... I, I don't know that much about the government's interest in him, but I know that he had a hard time finding work during the Red Scare. So Peltz being connected to those two it was probably enough. Um, they had a they had a long and long and very troubled the entire time relationship. So they met. Uh, Amanda was his first wife and his second. Uh, they met right after the failure of his first novel, as, as I mentioned, when he was in this sort of depressive fugue and. Um, she was as well in, in 35. She had been in a relationship with a married man, gotten pregnant, 
had an abortion at his request, illegal at the time, obviously, didn't want to be with him, but was sort of being emotionally manipulated into staying with him. And at this moment where he thinks his literary career has died before it began and she needs desperately to get away from this creep, they find each other. So I always think of them as two drowning people clinging to each other. And, and that's sort of, that's the, the basis of their relationship. So they have this they have this shared history that makes them want to stay together, but they are not meant for each other. Amanda wants to end up in the suburbs. She wants two kids and a car. And Nelson, especially when they meet, is is revolutionary. And, and you know, they have these talks where he says, okay, I will pay the rent and you buy the food and we're going to divide things up. And she says, no, no, <laughs> I'm going to stay home. Um, in any case, it, they break up she cheats on him, they fight, they break up, they get back together, <clears throat> um, sporadically see each other in the 40s, and then they remarry. Uh, Nelson has a storied relationship with Simone de Beauvoir, and as that's kind of falling apart, he's also drawing close to Amanda again. And so they decide to get back together, and they remarry, which is an, just an awful idea. Um, which, you know, he knew. He actually proposed to her, and she accepted, and she started making plans to move to Gary. And before she even moved, he wrote to friends saying, I made a mistake. I, <laughs> and, and so they, they try to make it work, her more than him. Um, and then eventually, you know, he struggles a lot during the Red Scare. He's having a hard time making money. That doesn't do any good turns to their relationship. Um, and as his career is sort of crumbling, they break up. She moves out. She ended up in California, um, where she lived until she died in Los Angeles. She worked for a labor attorney for a while. She also worked to the ministry, worked in the film industry for a short period of time. Um, I can't remember the year she died. I want to say 90 or 91, somewhere in there. No, no, and you know, Nelson is often blamed for the failure of that relationship, and he deserves his share of blame. But I, I would also point out that she never had any other long-term relationship in her entire life, and she was also sort of a prickly character by most accounts. But after him, no, she kept his name and never remarried. Uh, no. And none, I mean, none with him, and none afterward that I have ever heard about. But they didn't speak, I mean, they didn't speak after maybe 58 so, for many decades. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he, well, as I, I started off saying, you know, Nelson always wanted to be a journalist, but couldn't be. Um, but he still loved that scene. Um, and he would hang out at all the journalist bars in the 50s and 60s. And he knew all of those guys. He knew Royko. Um, and he hung out with studs all the time. Um, you know, he was known to up-and-coming journalists as this sort of guy from the last generation who was always at the bar after everybody filed their last stories. Um, but yeah, he was, he was on friendly terms with most of those guys. Yeah. Uh, sure, that's a quote from, I believe, Nonconformity. Uh, yeah, this is from a book-length essay Algren wrote about the politics of authorship. Uh, I'll, I'll just read the whole graph so it makes sense. Uh, never has any people possessed such a superfluity of physical luxuries companioned by such a dearth of emotional necessities. In no other country is such great wealth acquired so purposefully, put to such small purpose. Never has any people driven itself so resolutely towards such diverse goals to derive so little satisfaction from attainment of any. I was, so Algren um, was involved with another woman, this is not Amanda. Um, in the 50s, he became involved with a woman who he wrote about using a pseudonym, uh, Margot. He wrote a story about her and began writing a novel about her, although not using that pseudonym. Uh, and uh, Dave Peltz knew her. And so one of my good sources of information uh, is a journalist named Jan Herman. Um, he was a friend of Algren's, and after Algren's death, he began uh, researching his own biography in the 80s, did loads of interviews, never managed to get the book together, uh, but when I started working on mine, he gave me all of his research material. So he had it, many, many interviews with people who are long deceased, and Peltz said definitively, Paula Bays is Margot. They're all, what's that? Peltz is dead, yeah. Um, Jen interviewed him in, I want to say, 83 or 84. And there's also correspondence that exists. So once, 
once I had that interview identifying her, then I could go more purposefully through Algren's archive. And there are letters from, I mean, there are a number of things that help me confirm it. There are letters from her ex-husband to Nelson. There are letters from her to Nelson. And he actually testified at her divorce proceedings. Um, so you can write to the Chicago courts and you can get Paula Bays versus John Bays. And one of the two witnesses that appeared at the divorce proceeding is Nelson Algren. Uh, the other, oh, I'm going to forget his name right now, a friend of Nelson's who became a philanthropist, in, in any case. So, yeah, Margot, for anybody who is deep enough into Algren's work to know who that is, Margot was a woman named Paula Bays, who uh, had been an addict um, and a sex worker, and uh, Algren helped her get out of that life, and she married a union working class guy, and as close as I can tell, had a good life. Her, her trail kind of dies off, unfortunately. I have not been able to find her. I looked long and hard. Yeah. The, the letters that Simone wrote to Nelson have been published and uh, are widely available. His letters to her have never been published or released. Her heir, um, Sylvie, Sylvie owns them and has allowed on a rare occasion people to look at them, but has never allowed them to be photocopied. Um, I know there have been efforts to get her to release them in the past, but she will not let go of them. I have only heard speculation, um, but it's just that, so I'll tell you after the camera's off. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I loved his work, first and foremost. Um, I mean, there's a, the, the longer version of the story is that um, in uh, in 2009, during the Great Recession, I was myself sort of feeling like the world was crumbling and uh, I was in loads of debt and facing uncertain job prospects and feeling that uh, American literature was sort of not dealing with what America was going through at the time. I complained about this vociferously until somebody said, you should check out Nelson Algren's work. He has something to say about that. Uh, and, and indeed he did. So I grabbed on his books, uh, literally at random off a shelf. It was the only book that the store had. Um, and, and I loved it. I loved the prose. I thought it was deeply insightful. I mean, I thought he had, he had things to say about the thirties and the forties that were so fully realized that they applied today. You know, he, he then was writing about income inequality. He was writing about criminal justice issues. In the forties, he was writing about the opioid epidemic that started after the war, where people were trying to escape this sort of new emerging late capitalist reality and feeling adrift. And all of those things I, we're still wrestling with. And I thought that it was just incredibly prescient work. And then when I got deeper into it, um, I got very attracted to his ideas about the purpose of literature, which is another thing that I don't, you know, obviously the literary culture is, is very rich and deep in America these days, but there are gaps. And I think we don't spend as much time talking about the purpose of the function of literature as maybe we should, right? I think we're very focused on form these days, which obviously is valuable. Um, but so that sort of, his ideas along those lines filled a gap for me um, and ended up becoming a theme in the book. Yeah, his greatest legacy, oh God. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, he had his hits and misses like anybody. Um, you know, I like to think that the five books that he wrote between 19, or the five books, yeah, the five books he wrote between 1942 and uh, 1953 would stand up to just, just about anybody in the American canon, canon. Never Come Morning, The Neon Wilderness, Man with a Golden Arm, Chicago City on the Make, and Nonconformity. Um, I mean, it shows just an incredible depth of talent and, and range, right? There's a prose poem in there. There's short stories. There are two great epic novels. There's a book-length essay about the politics of literature. Um, you know, he, he was a Renaissance man to some extent. Uh, deeply read, you know, felt his characters in a way that I think that you don't often find in literature. Um, and, and I do think, you know, his ideas about the purpose of literature, even though they don't all feel like they directly apply anymore, I think his constantly pushing writers to invest in figuring out what their work means and what it should mean and what, it, what role it should be playing in society is part of his legacy. Um, should be recognized as a larger part of his legacy, I think. You, um, no, I would say no. Um, I mean, he, he did have this wonderful moment um, 
of recognition, right? Receiving the first National Book Award, and he was feted afterward. Um, but I think if he had been writing in a well, I go back and forth about this. If he'd been writing at a different time, his work wouldn't have been so impactful, so maybe it wouldn't have been recognized. But, you know, I often feel that he would have received more rec recognition and more accolades if the Red Scare hadn't happened, if America <clears throat> hadn't taken this dark political turn in the 1950s. Um, but who knows, right? Because then maybe his work wouldn't have resonated at all either. Uh, but I would say, no, he didn't receive the recognition he deserved. He started getting some at the end of his life. Um, which he was grateful for and enjoyed, but it didn't do much to help his career, unfortunately. I'm getting the I'm getting the one more. <laughs> I, I I wrote a, a brief essay for Algren's publisher, Seven Stories Press, about discovering his work in this period of time that I was talking about um, in '09. I, as was said in the introduction, I was a high school dropout and <clears throat> uh, worked for a long time before I went to school. So. Later in life, I made this big investment in doing what was expected of me. And uh, in 09, I didn't feel like that was a smart move. And, and you know, Algren had something to say about that, which I was grateful for. But I'm, I'm sure the museum could add a link to that essay. Sure. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Yeah? Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>